Hi everyone, welcome to Ben's Business Podcast. I've got here John uh, Stonmez, that's your second name? Yep, you got it. From Bulldog Mindset. And John is someone I've been following on Instagram for a good while. Um, I, I recently watched your interview with Andy DeMarco. Uh, it was actually something I was trying to achieve myself and uh, get MJ DeMarco on the podcast. And uh, I came across your stuff and really enjoyed it. So, on I'm, I've just got your kind of description from what bio I've grabbed from the internet, which is um, a multi-millionaire, best-selling author, stoic, and you help men achieve financial freedom, the physique, and get the girls that they want. So that's what i have about you but i think it would be best if you give us a, a bit of an introduction about who you are and maybe summarize your life over the last sort of 10 years sure yeah so you know i mean what i do now is i i run a couple of companies and, and i do real estate investments so you know we you already talked about bulldog mindset that's really the thing that i'm focusing on right now is building up that brand i'm mostly on youtube creating content on there and it's really focused on men and, and teaching men personal development, really teaching them how to be men today, which which is sorely needed. And to be able to you know do the things that I think men should be able to do, which is to be able to make money, you know, become financially independent if they choose to get the physique that they want to be able to build themselves and their their health and and then uh, you know the dating side of it to to be able to handle that in in a world today where it's it's very difficult to to understand exactly how to uh, to navigate those waters. So that's what I focus on, and I focus on really the core of it, which is what I call the bulldog mindset, which is the victim, uh, the the opposite of the victim mindset. Right? Too many people today have that victim mindset and that prevents them from succeeding in life. And so I've come along you know i started off as a software developer and my first company simple programmer which we i cater to basically teaching soft skills to software developers i did some technical training and things like that but i found that soft skills again was the most important thing that developers needed to learn communication and in personal skills and career development skills and so that's how i started going down that path really focusing on personal development and you know, I've been doing real estate investing for probably the last uh, twenty years, and so that's just something that I just have ongoing. And so, you know, through those couple of companies, and I do coaching, personal coaching, coaching people on on all all types of things, including real estate investment and and fitness and, and building businesses. Okay. That's uh, that's pretty much where I, where I'm at right now. Okay, right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I was doing a bit of research on who I was interviewing today. Uh, I have kind of kept up with a lot of your Instagram posts, and I thought I would deeper with YouTube, which is not a usual way that I consume. So it was quite an interesting journey. I've learned a few extra things I didn't know about you, and it could bring up some questions. So in terms of real estate investing, is this where you got financially independent is that what was the right track for you or was it the the programming as well yeah so it's really a combination of things right so the real estate investing is is what allowed me to technically be financially free to be retired because it generates a passive income you know as close to truly passive income as possible you, you can have a business that's functioning that's kicking off income but it's not really passive and it's not long term in terms of you know you you could in you know, maybe yeah, i could take one of my businesses and i could not do anything and just have it operate and and make some money for it, uh, you know from it for the next maybe five years but eventually it'll start to go downhill it's not something that you can completely be hands off and and expect it to last forever so what i did was i started investing in real estate with the long-term plan of a minimum of you know 20 years 20 to 30 years of investing and just buying properties having the mortgage being paid by the tenants living in in there and then hopefully them appreciating in value but but not really depending on that just having the, the income that would would come in from the rent from that and so what happened was with the business stuff that i did including uh, you know i had some good 
so, some good opportunities like creating courses for an, an online company called Plural Site, uh, which I'm I'm no longer with them anymore. But I generated was able to generate a lot of money from royalties from that, from publishing some books, from the business income, and I was able to put that money into real estate to pay off loans in real estate to buy new properties and so that really accelerated the progression so it's really the combination of those two things if you if you just invest in real okay. estate right you're gonna you, you're gonna eventually reach financial independence but it might take 20 to 30 years in order to do that which you'll still put you way ahead of the curve of, of most people retiring and, and retiring with with very small amounts but if you can combine the two and utilize the business to have a way to generate a lot of cash and then put that cash into something like real estate. That's, that's the best way to be able to do this quickly. Right. So, you know, you're familiar with MJ DeMarco and the millionaire fast lane. That's the fast lane, right? Mm -hmm. The, the, the slow lane or, yeah. or medium lane is, is just doing the real estate. So. Okay. So was that employment then that was, you were employed by a company where you made, you earned your income. And you put that money into real estate investments. I, I, when I started out, I was, I worked for different companies, just doing either contracting work or working as an employee. I worked for all all kinds of companies: HP, Xerox, some startups, and, and things like that. But then eventually, I ended up creating my own business and getting out and working for myself, doing a lot of freelancing work, and eventually just selling products like I do now. And and running you know, simple programmer was was the main main thing that I did, and that that built up revenue from that. And then as well as doing yeah. courses for a company as a contractor, as an author, essentially that uh, paid me royalties. So that was you know the way because just a regular income job is not really typically good. It's going to be enough to invest in real estate, but it's not going to be enough to get to that level where you're able to retire early. You know, unless yeah. uh, at least you know it's going to take a while. So. So the, the courses, the, the content creation for courses really help you scale in terms of that and come with that skill. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, you know, having that and having the business income w was critical to to making the timeline okay. a much shorter condensed timeline. So sure. Yeah. Yeah, because I heard you in a, a video kind of breaking down and your kind of struggle and your position when you were realized you're being paid very helpfully by your employer uh, i think it was 75 pounds uh 75 dollars per hour and you're earning a good amount more than most people at 90, age of 19. Um, but what you're saying is even with that it was going to take 13 years for you to eventually get to a point of a million pounds which is, seems to be everyone's goal exactly yeah yeah that and that's when i realized that you know there had to be a better way because at that time you know i was like 19 years old and i was making you know a ridiculous amount of money so if i wasn't going to like you know if, if from my salary i wasn't going to become rich then i i thought okay no no one is going to from from a salary it doesn't it doesn't make sense this path is it's definitely the wrong path and then i even looked at you know looked at, okay, well, what if I invest in the stock market or, you know, mutual funds or 401k or, or something like that to, and it just, no, it, it there was no way that it was going to be possible without something like real estate or, or business. And that's what got me into real estate was realizing, okay, all the people that have really made money that become wealthy in the United States, they all, it's all mostly because of real estate. That's the, the biggest factor yeah. that, that they have in common. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just clever position then along with having a revenue first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure everyone who comes on live today leaves us any comments and uh, questions that you have for John today. Um, let us know that you're online, all online as well. And also uh, let us know if the audio is good, the, the, the you can hear us okay. There's no problems with the connection. Because uh, you will only know if you comment. So, moving on to from that, uh, I wanted you to dive deeper, a wee bit, dive deeper into like what is the bulldog mindset. My assumption is that your it's your mindset that you've built, and you're now giving people that mindset. Uh, would that be correct? And but please, please elaborate on that 
and and how it's different from the victim mindset sure yeah so yeah so you're you're mostly correct on that that would be you know the, the reason why i formed the company and called it bulldog mindset was because with my other company with simple programmer when i was creating videos on youtube and i was creating really a mix of personal development stuff on there oftentimes i'd get people that would come and they would say well how do i develop that bulldog mindset that you have right and that's that was one of the the big questions i would get and multiple people use the same terminology of, of bulldog mindset so i thought okay well there's something here that if people are using this terminology what does this this mean and mm -hmm. You know what it represents is is like I said I the best way to describe it is the opposite of the victim mindset. It's the idea that you take full responsibility for your life, right? It's it's about choosing that you're going to you know make stuff happen that if you want something in life that you're going to go out and you're going to go get it and you're not going to wait for it to be handed to you. It's really related to stoic philosophy and, and rooted in stoic philosophy and this this idea that it doesn't matter what is happening externally. You can only control what you can control. And, you know, you're just going to have to take the, take whatever happens at, and, and, and accept it, but still choose to, to take action on what you can and what you can control. It's, it's really being, you know, self, self-sufficient and having self-efficacy, yeah. right? That's, that's really the, the key of it. And, and, you know, yeah. there's a, an element of, of having that grit and determination and not giving up and being like a bulldog latching on and never letting go to of, of something because that's, what's so critical to success. So it's sort of all of those things okay. and but really it's it's rejecting this this victim mindset and if you reject the victim mindset you'll find yourself you know having to take full responsibility for your life which means that you'll have to become stronger it means you'll have to become tougher it means that you'll have to develop the skills and the emotional mastery and mental toughness that is required in order for you to actually achieve the things that you want in life because you can't blame it on someone else yep yep I think a lot of people can learn that mindset or overcome the, the victim mindset. Right. Could do with that. The other question I have for you is what was your goal going way back to the, you, when you first got on the track of um, building financial independence, financial freedom? What was the goal originally, say, back? 20 years ago, uh, what was your goal then? And what was your, what's your goal today? And how yeah, is it so, different? Yeah, so my goal then was was pretty simple. I just wanted to be able to, it, well, it was, I wanted to have my time so that I could just, I could not work anymore and I could just play video games all day. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I just wanted to like, quote, retire young and not have to work anymore. Right. That was sort of my my goal. And, and really, like financially, I looked at making like five thousand dollars a month passive income because I thought, OK, if I make five thousand bucks a month and I could do that from real estate and it's passive, then I won't have to work. And, you know, and, and that would be great. And what actually happened was I achieved that goal around probably it would have been, I guess, about six or seven years ago. Right. And. And at that time, that's what I went to Hawaii to go live on the beach and just, you know, drink my ties and do nothing. And I did that for about two months. And then I was realized that that's no good. I can't do this. I have to I have to keep on going. I'm not, you know, I may be retired, but I'm not retired. Like, I'm not going to stop working yeah. or stop doing anything. And so what I ended up doing was setting some bigger goals and realizing, having really a realization in life that it's not about the goals that you achieve. Even it's not, it has nothing to do with that because and that was one of the most depressing points in life was when I had reached my goal. And the reason why is because it's not about the goals you reach. It's about who you become in the process of achieving the goals. The goals don't matter themselves. It's it's all about the process of, of, of growth, of, of growing as a person. And when you stop growing, you die, right? As Tony Robbins says all the time. So what I started to do was look at bigger goals, but in the, in the term, in basically, in the way that those goals would affect me and drive me as a person to become who I wanted to become. And so, you know, now I would say that my goals, I've got, you know, I've, I've got a lot of different ones, but, but again, the goal is no longer the, the, the end product, right? So I'm training for a hundred mile race next year. I'll be running a hundred mile 
uh, race and, you know, I've, I've done some marathons and, and whatnot. And, you know, I've got goals around uh, building up the, the, the financial, the, you know, sides of the business. I'd like to build bulldog mindset to be, you know, a, a $500,000 a year business and to uh, get the membership up to, you know, $10,000 a month on, on the membership that I'm selling there. I've got goals to get simple programmer up to a million dollar a year business and and some goals around real estate and building up passive income further right so those are mm -hmm. are sort of the goals that, that i've got now but really you know the biggest goal i would say or the biggest thing i'm trying to do is is more about making an impact that's you know the, the monetary stuff is fine i don't really need any money i'm i'm financially independent like i said from from the real estate and from the income that i've got coming in i don't i don't have to work but what I really want to do is make an impact. And the more that I can grow the businesses and the more that I have those resources, the bigger the impact that I can make to, to spread that message. And I'm always going to be doing that. You know what I mean? That's, that's something that I'm, I'm, you know, I felt, I found out that I'm not going to retire from this. I'm, I'm going to continue to, to learn and grow and develop myself and then teach what I'm learning to others. So. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So, I think it seems to be a process that a lot of people who have become successful financially go through. The, at first, the goal is, let's say, is some way selfish and about us getting out of survival and getting kind of on our feet and kind of um, in control of our life. And then when we reach there, then it's about it's more about it's more selfless. It's more about others. Yeah, I, I would say that that's true. I mean, I think you start to realize what's important in life and 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 this idea of purpose, right? Because you're you know you're always striving to to reach some point financially, but then when you realize that that it actually doesn't doesn't matter that much, it doesn't really change. I mean, there's definitely some things that are great about being financially independent for sure. You know, having your time and and uh, being able to choose what you do with your life, but then there becomes the point there comes a point of choosing what to do with your life, right? Most, most people are not choosing what to do with their lives or they, or they have, they've made a choice, but they don't understand the choice that they've made because they're just going to work and, and they're just getting their paycheck and then, you know, waiting for the weekends and, 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 and watching television shows and their life is just going by without them really making conscious choices of what to do with all of their time. Right. Because yeah. they're just taking the default path. But once you reach a certain level of financial success and you have your time back, then you really have to make choices of what you're going to do with your life. And I think that's where mm -hmm. it, it, you, you start to have that realization that it's not just about, you know, you can't just spend your life trying to make more money that, that that's not going to really improve anything, but, but what is the, the mission? What is the thing that you're, you're going to do with your life that that's impactful and, and valuable. And that's, you know, I think that's where you come to that realization. So. Yeah. W would you recommend the path that you've taken? exactly step by step no definitely not i mean for me yes i would because you know i don't really believe in regrets i believe that yeah. i wouldn't be the person i am had i not gone through the experiences that i did and and the the directions that i needed to go in life but if i were advising someone you know start starting over if someone were were sort of in my shoes when i was like 18 or so i would I would advise differently. I, I would say to never work for someone okay. else, to never get mm -hmm. a job, to always just start with your business. And yeah, you're going to be poor for quite some time, but <laughs> ultimately it's going to be the best thing that you do, right? Because within, you know, so many years, let's say five years, it takes you maybe to get, to get off the ground and to, to figure out enough stuff to actually make money. Then you're going to be pretty much making more money and have freedom uh, th than you would at a regular job. And so that's, that's one of the big things I would, I would recommend in, in a path that I, I would take, uh, you know, okay. uh, there's probably some other things I would say in, in terms of, uh, you know, of, of learning discipline quicker in life and, and the importance of, of developing that, that mental toughness and emotional mastery, you know, reading a lot of books early on in life would, would make a huge mm -hmm. impact on your life. You know, there's definitely a different path that I would recommend that, that people go, okay. but you know, that just comes from the hindsight of, of, of being yeah. here and, and, and seeing it. So. 
Mm, okay. That's interesting because um, I've heard different answers to that question where most people would recommend the path they took. Uh, but like you said, you, you kind of, you're glad you took in your path because it's made you who you are today. Whereas you know that there could have been a faster route or a, a better route in, in some way for other people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, if I get reincarnated, if, if we have like Groundhog's Day and I get to do it over again, I can get, I can get here faster. Get there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think that's everyone's around. dream to go back to high school with like our <laughs> level of confidence and skills and start again from there. Yeah. Um, That was all the thing I, I wanted to ask you about, like where you've built your philosophy. And I know that you've done a bit of reading in philosophy, and is it sp specifically Stoic philosophy that you study, or what areas are you reading just now? And what has it done for you? Like, what kind of impact has, has philosophy done for you in terms of your success in lifestyle and and uh, financially? Yeah, so I yeah I study pretty much all philosophy. I said most of the great philosophers, you know, Hegel and Kant and uh, Schopenhauer and, or uh, what's his name? Um, uh, you know, uh, mo most of, most of the, you know, John Locke and, and all those guys, uh, John Stuart okay. Mill, but, uh, but Stoic philosophy, I think is, is, is key because it is more about, you know, so some of these philosophies and philosophers go, into searching for the answers to, you know, what is a moral right and, and, you know, how should society be governed? And, and those are all great, you know, questions to, to look for answers to, mm -hmm. but Stoic philosophy is about living your best life. And I think there's a huge value in that. So that's greatly influenced. My life is just the idea of the concept that you can't control everything outside of you, that the only thing that you can really control is your own mind, your interpretation of events. And that is powerful when you realize that because it's the truth, right? That's ultimately the truth. And so that's helped me tremendously in my life because it's basically made me responsible for how I feel about things, right? And so I can't really say someone's making me angry or someone's done something to me because I've made that choice. And understanding that it gives you a lot of power in your life. And so that's really helped me to be able to to be able to just, you know, to take charge and to to decide that I'm not going to let something stop me and to also to have the ability to face adversity. Right. I think the biggest thing that shuts us down is when a, a bunch of, you know, we, we have a shit storm and, and a bunch of stuff comes our way and it's not good and then we we give up or we we let that take us down but you know being able to face adversity being able to face hardships and, and when bad things happen and just keep on soldiering on that's that's the critical skill for success because every mm -hmm. path to success there, there's always going to be some some bog that you're going to have to go through some swamp of despair and some hard times and if you turn around when things get hard you're never going to make it to the end. You're never going to get to the the point where the, where the true success lies. So that's really the biggest takeaway is just being able to push on through, through the hard times and to, yeah. to, to have that mental toughness. Okay. And does that get you through marathons? Through what? Oh, through marathons. Yeah. That in the, that, that in the training, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the yeah. thing is like, it's for something like that, for running a marathon, it's really what you put in, right? It's, it's like that quote mm -hmm. that the the more you sweat in training in practice, the the less you bleed in battle, and and that's very right. very true. So, but mm -hmm. you know, at, at the point where you're you're in that run and and you've got to make it to the to the end, hopefully you've already got the mental toughness built up from the training. But it does it does help you to push through to know that you're going to complete it when you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've never heard that as a, a unique or a different take that I've heard on uh, your your perspective of Stoic philosophy, which is interesting. Mm. 
could you give it maybe one example how you've been a stoic in, in your life like how you're practicing it yeah so you know one i could think of fairly recently was i was with some friends in la and i got a i got a text from uh from someone who who told me that uh that he needed to talk to me because this uh this guy i had invested with uh had had gone to jail so i got on the phone with him and and he told me about how you know this guy that i invested like three hundred fifty thousand dollars with recently had basically was in jail in new york for fraud and mm -hmm. uh <laughs> and basically that i that i was you know the, the implication was that i was screwed that yeah, my my money was basically gone or or highly at risk, and I remember you know getting the phone call and and talking to him and and I thought to myself immediately, all right, well you know if that's what it is, it is right. So I, you know and and I got off the phone and my friends were asking me what happened and I told them and they said, wow, you know what what are you going to do? Do you need to go home? Do you need to go drive home and and deal with this and and I'm like, well, there's nothing that I can really do, right? Like this is either, you know, I have to find out more information, but me panicking and, and making calls right now isn't going to make any difference. And, you know, and honestly, if I lost the money, I lost the money. Maybe I made some bad decisions and chose the wrong person. But, you know, I was able to to function and to, to not right. even really be upset. Like, you know, to in, in my mind, I obviously I don't want to lose $250,000, right? But at the same time, I don't have control over that. I don't, I had control when I chose to invest the money. I didn't have control over what happened at this point. And I have control over what I can do going forward, but I don't have control over the facts that I just heard. So there's no point in being upset about this and, and to be, uh, to be angry or, or, or whatever, you know, to, to fight this reality instead to just accept it. And that's, uh, that's what I did. And I just went on with my day and you know i dealt with the problem and it turned out to not be it is is dramatically of a, of a big deal and part of it was because i was able to deal with it rationally so i prevented it from becoming something that could have been uh that could have been much worse but but yeah, yeah. that was you know exactly that was kind of the point you know when i looked at when i look at myself and i'm like okay you know do you actually practice the soak philosophy like are you able to actually become insulated from the events of of fortune and fate and to me that's that sounds pretty clear in my mind like okay yeah you know if you can take that kind of a of a potential loss and not really get flustered and upset about it that's that's what we're trying to do with soak philosophy is to be able yeah. to to do that mm, yeah it's like a practice mm. that when the big events come you have to be kind of ready like a marathon Yeah, so like you were kind of ready for that happening to you. Whereas, um, let me ask you that: Do you think you would have been ready ten years before if something like that major happened to you? No, I would have flipped out. I right. would have been <laughs> yeah a mess. It would have disturbed me for weeks. Right? You know, those are the kind of things that can that can be the event that destroys your life. Right? Like, you know, yeah. some people's life are destroyed when they lose a few thousand dollars right from you know just because they they dwell on it and they go crazy about this thing and so yeah it would have destroyed me for sure you know 10 years prior right and how did you develop that level of stoicism to deal with that situation is there anything specific that you did over those 10 years to build that up or being able to survive mentally and emotionally those that situation coming up a lot of it is really just the practicing of it every day and the small things right to realize you know s some of the things like you can't really change your beliefs directly but you can influence your beliefs over time by what environment that you're in what you read and what you practice right and so for me i spent a lot of time reading about stoic philosophy and 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 books of that of that nature and, and studying mental toughness and, and people that have, have written on that but i also put it into practice every day with small things right everything from being stuck in traffic and not getting upset and practicing emotional mastery over uh, over those those things and 
and just you know so sometimes envisioning the worst right envisioning an outcome that's bad and then accepting that learning to accept that thing you know i think there's a crossover in mm -hmm. some buddhist philosophy here as well which has been helpful to study and, and see that you know this idea of acceptance right because that's that's really the key is to accept and not try to fight reality because it is what it is and when you realize the deep truth in that it's actually it, it's actually the natural response is to not be upset by things is because why would you be upset about what reality is and would i want reality to be anything other than what it actually is right to, to to try and want reality to be something other than what it is is frustration and and that's why you get frustrated so i put that into practice mm -hmm. a lot in my daily you know in just just my daily life and then some of it is just things like you know i i fast uh, my, my general routine for fasting is that I eat once a day. So I fast until dinner every single day. I've done that for over five years. And then I do a couple day okay. fast. Like today I'm I'm fasting or I fasted all day yesterday and I'll be fasting until dinner time tonight. And I'll go on crazy runs and, and push myself, you know, running marathons mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So that's all developing sort of this mental toughness, almost like a callous for your mind. And that yep. is, is something that, you know, what's his name talks about that David Goggins calls it a callus, you know, in your mind. And, and as you develop that toughness, you realize that if you can deal with things like starvation and extreme, you know, denial of the self and, and, you know, brutal workouts that there's really not all the other things by comparison become not so bad, right? When, when someone yes. says something to you or it insults you or doesn't do what you want them to do, like you've gone without food for several days. Like you, you, you know, you've done these other yeah, things. Like, like, yeah, exactly. It, all these things become a spec in life, and that that's really the goal. Is, is I think to you know, if you want to develop that, is to is to push yourself to those limits, and then it puts everything into perspective, right? And and then you can accept mm -hmm. those things, and you know, it's it's really just a path of 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 continuing to to seek out that truth and. And, and put it into practice every day, but that's that's been the progression that's gotten me to that that point where I could, you know, accept something that is you know, dr that would be devastating, I think, to to the previous version of myself. But um, but yeah. I'm able to to just kind of shrug off and and move on with my day. Okay, so for the people watching or listening now, they say they would freak out at that situation like that mm. you mentioned that like i think you said people and the books that you read will kind of help you over that in your previous self version um what books would you recommend that have helped you with that mindset and what people or places have you surrounded yourself in yeah so you know there's definitely a, li a good list of books here i'd probably start with Something like The Obstacles Away by Ryan Holiday. It's a really good book. That probably was the book that introduced me really into Stoic philosophy. And then, of course, uh, Seneca's Letters to Lucilius, which is a free, just a translation of, of Seneca's original letters. I feel like that's the best Stoic text that exists. Uh, reading through those letters, it's I think it's even better than Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, which is sometimes okay. kind of confusing to... To, to understand, even though there's, it's a good, you know, it's, it's a good text to read, but uh, I would also look at Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art, which mm. is a book about perseverance more than anything, about overcoming procrastination, which is this key to understand, you know, that, that fight that you have to, uh, you know, you fight in life that we all have to fight. Uh, let me try to think what other ones, um, I mean, there's some things that are, you know, I'm trying to pick out specific things that are kind of tangentially related that that are necessary to understand some concepts. I think Untethered Soul yeah. by Michael Singer is is a good one as well okay. to get the spiritual side of, of things, of acceptance. Uh, along with that, Eckhart Tolle's book, uh, was it The Power of Now? Uh, also, you know, yeah. has has a, a lot book. of elements. Yeah, and he talks about. In fact, one of the really good things he talks about in that book is he says that there's essentially three ways to deal with a problem that you have, and one is to remove yourself from the situation, 
Uh, the second is to accept it. And the third is to change it. But, you know, yeah. bitching and whining about it is not an option, right? Complaining does not, that's not accepting the reality of, of the situation. So yeah. let me see. Uh, as far as other other books in that in that nature, you know, like developing, well, I would say David Data's "Way the Superior Man" is a is a critical book. All men should read that book. As far as just understanding what it is to be a man, and and especially in a relationship, and there's a a lot of Stoic thought in that as well. Surprisingly, uh, let me see. And I'm trying to think okay. if there's anything else I'd recommend. I mean, I've got a ton of books, but I think that would probably be a good start. Yeah, yeah. I've got uh, this is shared in a book club, so. Uh, feel free to keep listening. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let's see. How about uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl? Mm -hmm. Because that book really, you know, the, the key stoic point in there is the idea that Viktor Frankl has that between what happens to you and how you react, there's a space. And that space is, is what's critical. That's what you decide to do. And, and you have that space and in making that space larger, that allows you to stop acting emotionally, which is, is, is something that prevents you from being stoic, right? To be stoic, you have to be able to, what I call, feel the pain and keep on walking. Uh, right. Let me see what else I would put okay. into that category. Probably, you know, I think everyone should read um, Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. Uh, that's just a, a great book yeah. about you know, really rebuilding yourself and choosing what values that you have in life, as opposed to just whatever story you've been dealt in life and, and the way that you've, you've been conditioned. It's choosing your own conditioning. Uh, try to think what else. Okay. Do you have a, a list potentially that you're looking at that uh, you might have on your website or something? I don't, I mean, I have different lists for different, different things on my, on my YouTube channel. You yeah. can find like the top, 10 books for men or, you know, I've okay. got, I've got some lists where I I've go over all the books I read in, in a year and, and things like that. Okay. But, um, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think, I think that's, I think that's probably, probably about it right now that I can, I can think of, um, well, I mean, one for mindset is, um, uh, what, what's the name of that book now? I gotta look and see. Oh, as a man thinketh. Yes, that's a one of my favorite books of all yeah. time. It's a good so, book, yeah, really good for mindset. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for for that. Uh, I've not read all of them actually. I've been gifted uh, obstacles away, and I've heard Ryan Holiday talk a lot about stoicism. But that's really interesting that you mentioned power of now, kind of in that section of stoicism. I've never really thought about it that way as well. But I suppose it is because it's about neutralizing the ego. And in some way, that is what stoicism is all about. Yeah, I, I mean, what it really comes down to, if I if I were to kind of bridge all the philosophies that I've studied and, and what I think is valuable in life is the idea of acceptance. Acceptance is probably the most important concept that you can understand. And that, that underlies stoic philosophy. It underlies, you know, Buddhist philosophy and eastern philosophy is just this idea of acceptance right things are mm -hmm. as they are and we need to accept reality it doesn't mean that we can't make changes in reality but at, at any moment whatever things are that is what they are it, there's there's no point being upset about it being mm -hmm. angry about it feeling cheated or ripped off or jealous or any of those emotions the negative emotions that we experience we experience all those emotions because we do not accept what is reality and especially in dealing with people yeah. right you know when i came to that realization i started dealing with people in the way that, such that i said okay i am go <clears throat> not going to have expectations on anyone and i'm not going to allow them to put expectations on me it was a life changer at that point i just accepted people as as who they are right people will lie and cheat and steal and 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 do things that will hurt you but you get to choose the interpretation of that, those actions. If you just realize that that's what, what people do and you do the same things, you know, to, to some degree and you just accept, you know, that, that they are who they are and they've done what they've done and they will do what they're, they're going to do. Then you can live at peace with, with people and not be upset by all the small slights that they do to you or, or how people treat you, you know, realizing that 
that it, it is just it is what reality is and and that's mm -hmm. you, you that that's where you can i think truly learn to love people is when you when you have that level of, of acceptance for them and you know i think that's just the the most most critical philosophy in life is just just to accept yep yeah, that's really, really true. Uh, I believe in that as well. But we, I was having a conversation with my friend today, and it was about that. that he's coming up to Scotland, but he got this worst cold, and it would be it's quite difficult to just accept that. Okay, I can't come, and that's it. But from that understanding, I was kind of sharing that with my friend and just saying. It's just a, like the seasons of life. When you get the cold, you can't do much about it. You just have to accept it, and that you're going to have to repair. You can't speed it up or uh, get better faster. You, you just got to accept that you're not well and you're not going to be able to to do much. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple of comments here. Um, a few questions. I just wanted to like respect the time as well because obviously we started a wee bit later. Um, have you got anything on? in the next five ten minutes oh no, no we can yeah we can do some you know pr probably like 10 minutes or so i could stay yeah cool yeah i just want to make sure because we start to keep it real uh, i noticed here that you were a big fan of elliot Hulse. um what kind of lessons did you learn from elliot uh, i think strength Sam? what was your one biggest takeaway yeah so yeah I, I attended his his what is it called the grounding camp is, is what his his latest thing is which is a lot of dynamic meditations and the biggest takeaway there was just this idea that, like just realizing that how much repression we still have within our bodies right like a lot of what we did there was kind of crazy just yelling and and shaking around and dancing and and looking you know what like looking like an idiot like just like you know just doing whatever comes to your mind and that's so hard to do right because we're so conditioned to worry about what other people think of us and to and we're repressing all of these these things within us and so my biggest takeaway there was 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 that to let that out that that is actually affecting us in, in a huge huge way that we're not really being our authentic selves and that we're, we're hiding we're we're basically suppressing a lot of a lot of that and that that creates a lot of problems for us so to be able to let that out and to be loose and to kind of carry that over right as i'm living my life i'm thinking now you know am i being constricted in my movements am i being constricted in my speech am i am i suppressing myself or am i letting myself out there and exposing myself allowing myself to be judged right or to you know to, yeah. to look like an idiot it's it's fine the, those things are it, it, we have this you know real sense of judgment of of what people think of us and that influences a huge amount of our behavior and that takes away a huge amount of our freedom okay yeah that's really interesting one of the things i have observed about you is that I feel like I'm still working on it is I, I like, I don't mind taking videos and knowing that I'm on live right now, but you go about with your camera kind of out and about with your, with your shirt off and you don't, you don't care. Uh, I, I'm working towards that. I still find, um, and I've definitely have proved I was recording like in a, in a group of people the other day, but I was kind of justifying myself at the same time. So, uh, have you got any tips on that? Like how, have you built that mindset up around like let's say it could be confidence or um that not caring of what other people think <laughs> yeah i mean that's all that's tough right that's that's something that you know i've got some theories on this which i call like there, there's levels of of freedom right so the first level of freedom is that you care what other people think so you don't do what you want you have the fear of you know of embarrassment right you know with a lot of the guys that i coach they're afraid to go and talk to a girl because they're afraid of what could happen or they're just they're just afraid it's just like an ego an ego fear right and so most people live in this level one where they're just they're not doing things they're afraid of and then you have this sort of level two of freedom which is probably what you experience where you did record in public but you did it out of really compulsion not out of free action so 
in order to overcome the level one, you decided that you needed to do this and that you're going to force yourself to do it, which is good. You have to get there first. But the problem with the compulsion level of, of freedom is that you still are you're going through the motions a lot of times and you don't feel comfortable and it's not what you want to do. It's what you're forcing yourself to do because you feel like you must do it. So you're facing your fears, which is good. But at the same time, it's not true freedom because those actions are, are compulsive. So someone in, in that kind of phase of, of level two of freedom, what they're doing, you know, again, if I was talking to someone who's doing, I was doing dating advice with they're they're just like, they're like, oh, I have to talk to every single girl that I that I want to talk to that I see that's attractive, even though they don't really want to, but they're forcing themselves yeah. to do it, which is good. It, it gets them over that that fear phase. But most people get stuck at at phase two, and so they never get to phase three. Phase three is is where you have the true freedom, where your action is not compulsed, but you're just acting how you feel out of natural instinct what you want to do you're like oh i want to turn on my phone and record right now so you're just doing it right but you don't feel like you must do it and that you must overcome these things and you know you're living with it with that true freedom the key to make that step to make that leap between two and three is bigger and bolder moves at level two in order to be able to allow yourself to to hit the point of of reaching level three so a lot of people get stuck in level two and because they're not fully committing right so i i kind of think of this as let's suppose that there's this this ditch that you need to jump across right what ends up happening a lot of times is if, if someone to, were to run up to to jump across that ditch they would get close to the edge of the ditch and they would actually slow down and then jump and fall in. <laughs> it, it's kind of <laughs> weird that we would do this, right? Like, it's like, oh shit, I'm coming mm. close to the edge, so I'm gonna slow down. And then, but what you actually really need to do to have the best chance of crossing that ditch is to run as hard and as fast okay. as you can yeah. and jump as hard as you can. And you might not make it, but you're fully committed, right? When you half commit, you fall in every time. And so there's no point, you should never jumped in the first place. But a lot of times this is just our natural human behavior. And so when we're in that level two of freedom and we're overcoming our fears and we're, we're kind of trying to not give a fuck what other people think about us, a lot of times we're still acting without the fully full commitment. And so if you want yeah. to, you know, to, to really like push yourself to that next level, you know, instead of just taking out your phone and forcing yourself to record in, in public and, you know, and trying to not care what people think, but you're keeping your voice kind of low and you're trying to not say anything, you know, you just kind of just, be bold and put the phone out there and be like, you know what? Fuck the world and fuck everyone. And I'm just going to talk and I'm just going to say whatever the fuck I want. And you're loud and you're bold and you're just doing it right. And just mm -hmm. pushing that, that envelope. And when you do that, then that, that sort of gets you to that point that that's like running and charging across that, that pit. That's where you really see that, yeah. that growth. It's the same thing again, when I'm talking to guys about, about dating and they're stuck in that, that phase where like, well, I'm talking to all these girls. I'm like, yeah, but you're not taking a bold move. You're not stepping out there and putting yourself out there and, and really, you know, being bold and exposing yourself. Like you're trying to play it safe yeah. still, even though you're doing this. So it's really about mm -hmm. like you're removing that, that trying to play it safe. And, and the more that you do that, because you know, the only way to build confidence is through experience. The, you start to get that experience and, and confidence really says, I know what the possible outcomes of a situation are. And I know that no matter what the outcome is, I'll be okay. That's how, how you build confidence. And so you have to take yeah. those bold actions in order to feel like, you know, that no matter what happens, you'll be okay. And as you start to do that, you'll start to build the confidence in that specific area. And then you'll have the freedom to be able to do that. So that's, you know, th that, that's, a, that's a key thing in order to, to progress there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's really good actually. Um, and I can see that in, in terms of the dating side of things as well, I can imagine because of these men have committing, like I've not had to date for 10 years because I'm about a girlfriend, but uh, for the men who are dating and they're half committed, they might even be attracting the wrong, the wrong woman as well because they're not being their, their 100% committed self. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's very true, right? It, it's yeah, and and they don't know who they. I mean, you really don't know who you are until you've kind of push to your limits. Like we, we all have this, 
the self that we that is within us that we haven't experienced very much because we're held back by inhibitions by what we're afraid of what other people will think be it by what we think that we're supposed to be and the mold that we're supposed to fit into and so you don't even know who you are right you don't even know who so who your authentic self yeah. is until you're able to break through some of this th these barriers yeah mm, that's true so i've got a uh, veer here who's putting some comments so i'll bring them up I don't know if you can see this as well, but I can read it. Okay, yeah, let's see if you hear. Uh, um. This big long one. Really interesting points. Join. I'm someone who's decided to start their own business relatively young, at least uh, compared to people I know. And one of my friends said, wouldn't it be better to get some experience in a bigger company first to see how things work well and what can you improve? What your what are your thoughts on that? I think you kind of answered that, but yeah, can maybe elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that this is, in most cases, a cop out answer. Of a lot of people want to say, "Well, let me work for a bigger company and and get some experience," but that's not really. I, I don't find that to be helpful. I find that to be just well. First of all, just to understand, like a bigger company like things operate completely differently. Like just going from working on your own to even just having one or two people working with you is a completely different company. It's a completely different thing. And when your team scales up to 10 or 20 people, it's still a completely different thing. And when it's a big company, a big organization, you know, a hundred people or more, it's, it's a completely different beast altogether. And so those things don't really carry over and relate instead. I, I think it's better for you to just go out and, and just learn and just do, you know, there, there's no reason why you can't, why you need to get experience at a bigger company in order to figure out how to build a company. There's plenty of books. There's plenty of resources out there in order for you to figure this out. And, and really what it comes down to is this fear of failure and the fear of doing the wrong thing. And you have to do that. You have to fail. You have to mess up. You have to make mistakes. The, the best way to possibly learn and to learn rapidly in life is to just take action, just quick action, and to to allow yourself to fail, to to try and you know figure out something that you don't have the answer, right? A lot of times what we want to do is we want the book, we want the exact guide, we want to know the exact steps that I need in order to reach success. And that approach it, it unfortunately it doesn't work like we can study and study and study for a long long time and we're still not going to have that perfect that, that, that perfect substitute for the wisdom and experience that, that you get from actually taking action and so it's better to leap in without knowing what you're doing and then to after you've formed all these questions because you've you've tried things and you failed and, and you're not sure about these things, then you go back and you find the mentor, you find the resources, you study yeah. those things, you learn from your mistakes and, and you progress. But you know, it, it's, it's that risk. Yeah. That's the way I've always done things as well. I, I always threw myself into my business. I, I didn't have much to lose when I started my business. I was here at home. So I had no overheads. Um, I'm glad I did it that way. And like you said, I was poor for a long time, but it was the best lessons I've ever learned. You don't get that out of books. Yeah, yeah. Um, YouTube success tips I've got as an illustration as well. Like I've been looking through your YouTube and uh, seen quite good impressive numbers of uh, view, views and comments uh, any have you got any tips on building a YouTube channel and to to, to, your, to, the, to the level you've built your channel to? yeah so there's a few things I would say I mean one of the big ones is to be prolific right to produce at one point I was producing two videos a day for like two years never missed a day uh, so it was consistency and commitment to it that that made a huge difference it's probably not as an effective strategy now or, or maybe even at the level that i'm at to be able to to do that but 
the idea is still the same of being consistent and committed, right? The frequency might not need to be two videos a day, but it needs to be a lot and you need to be producing that, that content consistently. The other things I would say that really helped me and really helped me to grow my channel was when I discovered, when I started being polarizing in, in the value of that. And what I mean by that is that, I mean, before then, I guess my YouTube channel was was pretty clean. I never said fuck. I never said any any curse words on there. And it, it's fine. I mean, you know, but I was also very neutral and I didn't share very many opinions that would piss people off. And I wasn't very polarizing. But then I started changing it up to be a little bit more authentic, to not really give a care what anyone thinks and just to say whatever I'm going to say, a little more unfiltered. And a lot of people hated that, but a lot of people loved it, right? It created that polarization, which is important right. to grow because if you're just some generic channel giving some generic self-help advice, for, for instance, and, and talking about, you know, how great, uh, you know, the, the power of now is just like everybody else is, <laughs> yep. right? Um, and just, you know, presenting the facts or whatever, no one's, no one's going to care. I mean, maybe some people will subscribe to your channel, but you know, when your video comes out, they're not going to care. They're not sharing that. They're not telling other people to subscribe. They're not all about that. But when you say some shit that makes someone mad or really makes them <laughs> decide, are they with you or against you, right? You start to develop your tribe and your people. These are the people that, and it doesn't have to be political at all. It can just be, you know, I, I coach some people in the software development industry and one guy was making a blog on JavaScript and he was like, should I, you know, talk about about politics on my javascript blog you know you said to be to be polarizing and i was like no <laughs> just talk about how you know you like such and such javascript framework and the other one sucks right and and just like you know polarize that way within the technology you don't have to be you know political pundit that's not yeah. the that's yeah. not the point like you know you're you're content shouldn't look like mine i'm talking about men and masculinity and 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 you know in men's issues that are that are controversial and, and somewhat political but you're talking about javascript so just be polarizing yeah. as far as what framework you oppose or how you should write good javascript code and and, and say that the other side is completely wrong and and really right. and be polarizing that way don't don't toe the line neutral so that's one of the really big factors is to be polarizing until just you know, to, to find your tribe and then and then, yeah, and then the last thing I'd say about growing YouTube is that you have to, if you can, pick something very specific, right? A specific niche. Don't make videos about a lot of different topics. And I say that knowing that I make videos about a lot of different topics, but really what ties everything together is the bulldog mindset is, is that mostly I'm dealing with with men's issues and, and helping men. That's like my audience. I would be more successful though if I did pick one of the things, if I just talked about finances or I just talked about fitness. I, I know that, but uh, you know, so, but but if you're starting out, certainly you wanna be as niche down as, as small as possible. Okay. Yeah, that, that's important though, isn't it? Like picking a niche is like sticking to one thing. I think that as well. That my Instagram's a bit like that. I just I enjoy talking about what's on my mind, and that can be fitness one day, running one day, business one day, and then something completely different about family or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you build a different kind of audience. You know, starting out is probably better to be very specific with the niche to build yep. up enough an audience and then you can kind of expand out because once you have an audience and okay. people are there for you, then it's, it's more likely that they'll pay attention and it'll be a little yeah. bit easier to grow. But to start out, it's better to be niche down as, as small as possible is what I found, you know, yep. coaching a lot of people and helping them to grow brands. And so, but, but yeah, you know, there's that element of, of wanting to do other things and, and yeah. so you kind of have to make that, that, that choice. And again, like I said, it doesn't have to be a permanent choice, right? I would recommend mm -hmm. starting out being very specific because it's going to be really hard to garner attention and to develop an audience when you're doing a lot of different things, but it's, it's much yeah. easier when you, you've got something specific. Yeah. I have noticed that the people's Instagram and YouTube grow rapid rates when they, decide, they have to just decide what they stand for and have a, an opinion and a niche. And then, then just go down that path for uh, consistently for a long period of time. Yeah. 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 
Okay, that's really nice. There was one other question I got in when I asked people about uh, some questions to ask. So we'll do that and then we'll, we'll finish up. Um, it was a really interesting question. It's something like I guess like I didn't I don't really ask my guests to bring on the podcast because it's it's fairly it's fairly negative. Um, but it's, it lets you what are the biggest challenges you're facing in overcoming? Yeah, so there's there's basically three questions. Like, what are the biggest challenges you're facing and overcoming at the at this point in your life now? And I'll ask another question. Okay. So the biggest challenges that I'm facing and overcoming in my life right now. That's that's the question. Uh, yeah, so hmm. That's that's a good one. I would say that the biggest biggest ones I'm I'm facing now is is at least in business is scaling up, is figuring out how to how to take things to the the next level which requires a large amount of investment in, in finding the right people and hiring people in, and really turning the business instead of something that's focused entirely around me, but more around the other people in the business and how to grow that. That's the, the biggest thing is like just turning over a lot of the range and, and taking the risk of investing the money into other other people okay. in order to grow the business, which is, which is hard. And I'm overcoming that by, you know, just, biting the bullet and just choosing to to do this and, and realizing that that a lot of what i'm doing right now may fail and probably will fail but it's a necessary step in order for me to learn in order to to grow right so that's that's probably the the biggest challenge i'm facing right now another one i'd say is is trying to be more consistent with with what i'm doing when i don't need to to, to work right so I've been trying to get my routine back on track and I travel a lot and I have a lot of different things that interrupt my, so if I'm on a perfect schedule, right. And I can just have like three months where I'm, I'm not traveling or anything and I can just, I can just work into a routine. That's fine. But it's hard when things disrupt your schedule, right? So I'm working on trying to be able to get right back into the routine and right back into the schedule and to be able to adjust yeah. with when I've got that chaos involved. So the way I'm doing that is, is building yeah. systems, right. And just having processes in place that I can, I can rely on and that I can just fall right back into, but uh, it's still tough. You're still figuring that out. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's a really good question because it's good to hear what successful people like yourself are still experiencing at, at your performance level and, and realizing that we, we all, deal with the same problems no matter where we are and like the other question that was related to that one was do you think there are any drawbacks to the way you live your life uh, drawbacks i think mean to be challenges uh, which you can answer uh, but i expanded that so i really understood the question. Uh, what do we not see what could I it was kind of breaking up a little. I had had trouble getting that the question. Though. Oh, sorry. Do you think there are any drawbacks to the way you live your life? For example, like what what do we not see? What could you share about your lifestyle that people would not expect? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely drawbacks. It's I, I think of it as that. The, the matrix, right? That that point where the the character, you know, wants to get put back into the matrix where he's eating that steak and, and he says, I forget what is the character's name is. He says that ignorance is bliss, right? And it, it's sort of like once you have figured out some of these things and you've you've kind of tasted freedom, you can't really go back. But sometimes you want yeah. to I mean, like the simple life of just going to work and when you're done with work you know, you're working for someone else and you punch out and you go home and you can just watch TV or do whatever you want to do. And, you know, and, and then you go the next day and then you, you've got the, like, there's, there's some, something great about that simplicity because which, which I'd call, you know, ignorance because you don't have to worry about what should you be doing at any given time. And you can just kind of, 
just run your life on autopilot. So there's, there's, you know, something about that, that sometimes I'm like, Oh, wow. You know, wouldn't it be great if I could just go back to that simple kind of life. Uh, but you know, I know that that's not true and it's not, it's not possible to do. And, and I really wouldn't want to at, at this point. So, because, yeah. you know, as, as someone who's an entrepreneur and who's responsible for their own time, I have to create my own structure. Right. You know, it, yeah. it's hard. Like humans weren't meant for freedom. Freedom is one of the hardest things that you can that you can deal with, even though it's the thing that you want the most. And the reason why is because you have to create your own structure. Right. You have to create. No one's telling me that I need to work, but I know that I need to. <laughs> I have to put that yeah, together yeah. for myself. It's If I have to go in and I'm going to get fired if I don't show up and I don't get my TPS reports done, then that's it's it's a framework that that helps me and guides me but when you ha don't have that framework and you have to create it for yourself it makes things in some ways a little bit more difficult because you you've got to yeah, yeah. be be doing that all the time and, and as an entrepreneur you know i'm always thinking well what should i be doing i should be doing something right you you feel like you always need to be taking action and and making yeah. forward progress right and then also the failures mm -hmm. right you know again it's like you know you mess up and things go wrong and you have to face the failures your, yourself and, and deal with those things as opposed to you know just something that happened at the company or you know doesn't doesn't really matter it doesn't affect you but mm -hmm. but these things mm -hmm. these things do affect you so there's definitely you know drawbacks in in that sense right. and and i would say also just from the kind of the stoic viewpoint like the stoic philosophy you you know you you lose sort of the the innocence of life and maybe the hopefulness that that you had when when you didn't know better and you didn't really understand human nature and you know that kind of fairy tale disney type of of, of romance when you realize that it doesn't exist it, it sort of takes away something from your life but it's replaced by something that is real and, and true so again it's it's all about like facing the realities a lot of people live in a fantasy world and to some degree those fantasies are nice but they're not the reality and so that's you know yeah i'd say those are the biggest drawbacks but even with those drawbacks mm -hmm. th there's so many benefits is there, there's so much that you know i definitely wouldn't give this up uh, in order to go back into uh, an in a blissful ignorance so yeah yeah okay yeah that's that's quite a deep question uh, a deep answer that's really interesting i i'd like to i guess like as I think it's human nature to want to balance out certain negative negativity with positivity. But I do come up with a sort of solution to what you were saying there. Children, like I have a seven-month-old and a two a two-year-old, and they, you can see that possible ignorance of um, that fantasy world that you're talking about through their eyes, if that makes sense. Yeah, and yeah. it's actually a great way to that regeneration of. Um, experience it's a way of experiencing that well being that logical uh, leader that needs to think learn and pray. can you hear me okay it's yeah it's the connection is a little little bad it's it's kind of breaking up a little bit okay but yeah well anyway i think uh, we've, could you summarize up this uh, interview to kind of end it up summarize up the interview and in, uh, in one sentence in one sentence I, I would say this go out and take action take risks and accept the consequences of those actions okay right thank you a lot for joining us john i've taken pages and pages of notes so right. that's me so i'm sure everyone else who listened and watched this today is found it really valuable so i really appreciate your time and joining us today yeah thanks ben thanks for having me yeah it's a pleasure right. Cheers. Yep. take care you too bye just now